This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Are you tired of nightly news reporting horrible weather disasters and never mentioning climate? You need a real meteorologist like Nick Humphrey. Nick lives in the American heartland in Nebraska with his young family. So far, you won't find him on a network station, but you can find Nick on YouTube on shows like Environmental Coffee House and Black Bear News, plus his Facebook page, which is very active, and Patreon. From Lincoln, Nebraska, Nick Humphrey, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Uh, thank you, Alex, for having me. Nick, why did you get your master's in meteorology? I've been interested in weather my whole life. You know, since I was a little kid, I got stuck in a blizzard at school overnight in Seattle. So it's, you know, ever since then, I've always had an interest in learning more about the weather and, and climate and trying to understand, you know, how it works and why it works. You know, so that's been my sort of long-term goal over the past uh, decade, you know, going to school and, and doing what I needed to do. And, and, you know, and so it's given me a real good insight into, into how the world and the earth works. One of your April articles spread around the net. It's called The Conversation No One Knows How to Have. What is that impossible conversation? Uh, the conversation, uh, to me, is the abrupt collapse of civilization and, and perhaps our extinction as a species and the extinction of other species on this planet because of abrupt climate change and also environmental destruction and, and pollution on this planet. You know, it's been a very... It's a very difficult conversation. You know, nobody wants to talk about it. It's taboo. But as far as humans are concerned, I always feel that, you know, if we're going to be here, we're going to be a conscious species. We should be conscious of not only, you know, all of our great structures and buildings that everybody and civilization that everybody always, you know, always thinks about that makes humans somehow superior to nature. But we should also deal with the fact that at the expense of all of that was the destruction of nature. You know, and eventually, possibly our destruction. And so, I, I, I really wanted to hammer that hard because um, it's happening. It's happening around us every single day on this planet. Things are getting much worse, and people are dying, and species are dying. And that's something that we need to be able to talk about and discuss and have a, a serious conversation about. Yeah, I mean, if you were in a school and someone was going from classroom to classroom, and they were just shooting one person in each classroom, they come in, they shoot somebody. And you tell the kids, well, let's not talk about that, and the kids agree that nobody's going to talk about that, and it just goes on. That would be insane, but that's the situation we're in. The species are being pushed off the planet, and we could very well be next, and we don't want to talk about it. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, it's you know, it, it's because we we become so uh, removed from nature with all of our technology. I mean, I'm you know, I'm a meteorologist. I'm a scientist. I deal with technology and computers and all this fancy stuff all the time. You know, but we become so removed from nature and not not just like going out and going out for a walk, but actually being a part of nature and dealing with the rigors of living in nature. You know, the threat of nature that as nature dies we insulate ourselves either, you know, whether it's it, we're in rural areas or in the city, we just insulate ourselves from this destruction. And I think part of that is because for the past 10,000 years, we have basically created civilization for the purpose of doing a couple of things. Number one, protecting ourselves from nature, you know, because we live in our homes, we congregate in cities, we can protect ourselves from species that on any normal day might kill us like a lion or a tiger or a bear. But we also uh, use these structures in these uh, societies that we've built to try to expand out and control nature, control rivers, control the oceans, you know, dole out land for each other and use the resources, as we call it, which is the land, you know, the animals, everything to our benefit to expand. And so now that process has led and is leading to the destruction of the very thing that we were trying to control like gods, but in, in fact we depended on all along, just like every other species on this planet. There's a video blogger in the northern U.S. who goes out on his bicycle every Friday to call for climate action, and I kind of admire him. I mean, nobody joins him, and he's there in the traffic, and he's saying, this is crazy. And I apologize to listeners, I've lost that link, and I haven't been able to find him again, so if you know who that is, 
please email me, or if that's you, email me. But anyway, he said he was in a rural feed store, and the customers were all saying they could not get out on their damaged fields to plant this year's crop, and you certainly know about that. But when our video blogger brought up climate change, everyone said, well, that's just false news. It's it's a liberal conspiracy. So, Nick, even when people are devastated by weather, hyped up by a changed atmosphere, they still don't get it. I, I don't understand it. I think part of the reason is is the human tendency to, to localize. And what I mean by localize is not only localize on a spatial level, you know, where I, I live in Lincoln, I live in Seattle, I live in Miami. So I think about the, the weather and what's happening here. You know, I live here. It's very, um, in geography, they call it activity space. This is my activity space, and this is what I know. It's also temporal localization, so people tend to normalize things. If you transported someone from, you know, I was, I'm was i originally from Seattle, Washington. I grew up there and lived there until the late 2000s. If you transported someone that lived in Seattle in 1950 and transported them to 2018, they would not recognize the climate of Seattle anymore. The summers are, are blazing hot. Like I, I lived in, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I barely recognize what's going on there now with 70, 80 degree temperatures in March and April. So it, it, that normalization, that psychological need to always see stability means that even when there's chaos, unless it's happening right in the moment, right in front of your face, like a terrorist attack or, or a natural disaster or a major weather event, a single event, you don't see the pattern very well unless you try to see it. And I think that's really a big problem with a lot of people, both climate deniers, like outright deniers of the science and everything, but even those that overall, you know, accept the science of, of climate change, they don't see it happening right locally. And I've had debates with meteorologists and the others that do not think that, you know, events, whether it be here in Nebraska or other, you know, things happening, say in the U.S., are necessarily connected to climate change. But climate change is, of course, a global illness, if you will. And so just like an illness in a human being, you look at one symptom in isolation, you might think it's just one little thing happening. But when you realize it's happening all over the person's body and different organs and everything else, then you realize it's much, much bigger than you thought, and that's what's happening on this planet right now. And, and it's hard for people to see it or want to see it because it, then you realize how much of, of an emergency and event in our Earth's history and human civilization it really is. Well, Nick, maybe you can help me with something. Every night we watch ABC Nightly News, and we do it just to see what Americans are being told. Climate change hardly ever comes up. All the advertising selling pickup trucks and SUVs probably tells us why. But this spring, it seems like the weather is the top news story. They're talking about massive storms sweeping right across the east from Texas through Nashville, right up to New York City and Boston. There's tornadoes. There's flooding. It's like every night they have a a weathercaster talking about this news. So what is the weather expert view on that persistent storm track this past winter and spring in the United States? Well, here's the, the normal part. Normally in, in El Nino, and that's what we have going on right now, a, a at least weak El Nino regime in the eastern and tropical, particularly the, this tropical central Pacific, you do get storm tracks that favor the southern U.S. But of course, with climate change, it juices up everything, meaning literally it juices up the water that falls out of the sky. So you get heavier snow heavier rain, higher rainfall rates that make it easier to saturate the ground. It gets You get more flooding. And then, of course, if you get the appropriate moisture and winds in the upper atmosphere, you get the tornadoes. And, I, and, I mean, last year was bad in the, in the south for tornadoes, even as it was dead quiet on the plains much of the season because of either severe drought on the southern plains or uh, huge, huge fires that occurred in Oklahoma while it was very cold up here in in Nebraska. But now it's even worse. Very, very, very active start to the season in Alabama, Mississippi, and there's already been quite a few people killed in these tornadoes. So for me, 
I've always tried to emphasize with people, there's no way you can actively in real time say this event is associated with climate change, that event is associated with climate change. You can do attribution studies, but really climate change is about loading the gun. Basically, you have events that more record events that occur relative to what you would expect with global warming. So you get more heat records, heavier rainfalls, but you also get a lot of events that are near records. They approach what you would typically see in the climate, but more often it's loading up. And then you get more of the the very typical events, and it all is an accumulative effect. So maybe an area that occasionally gets very heavy rainfall suddenly gets a lot more very heavy rainfall. Then they get more typical rainfall events on top of it. You can't dry out the soil, so you get flooding more easily. It loads up your region with whatever is extreme for that region, too much water, too little water, and it ends up damaging infrastructure, killing people, killing livestock, killing wildlife, making it more difficult for the plants to understand the seasonality. So they bud very early, and then they deal with a a killing freeze. That's really the effect of climate change to me. And And the faster climate change progresses, the more abrupt it is, the more devastating that accumulation is because it's occurring much, much faster than it was even in the recent time. Nick, let's get a little report from you. What happened to the farm community this spring in Nebraska? Uh, In short, it was catastrophic. I mean, it was just unbelievably catastrophic. There were over a million acres of farmland that was was flooded. Uh, They were just flooded out. Uh, Many of these areas... I don't know if they've actually calculated how many of these areas will, in fact, be unusable land, but there will be significant areas that are unusable ever because they're covered in three to four feet of sand that came from the rivers. So the rivers flood, they take over the landscape, but because this was, in many cases, fast-moving water, high water, they deposited tons and tons of sand all over many of these farmlands. So now you go out there and they look like beaches with no shoreline. About a million calves were estimated, at least last month, to have been killed in the floods. So in many cases, cows give birth during the spring, and these calves could not handle the cold, wet conditions, and some of them may, you know, either died from pollutants or hypothermia or other threats that would be threats to people, threats to the livestock as well, and they perished in the floods. So, you know, in addition, you had tons and tons of levees that were destroyed. And although the rivers have gone down in Nebraska themselves, such as the Platte River, Elkhorn Rivers, uh, Niagara Rivers, the Missouri, parts of the Missouri and the Mississippi are running very high. And I actually just, before I got on the air here, I I saw that Davenport, Iowa, um, had a temporary levee failure this afternoon, and they're flooding uh, right now. So it's... You know, in Nebraska itself, it was extremely bad. And now that snow melt and additional rainfall that we get just from, again, typical, more typical events is exacerbating the flooding and in, in downstream in parts of Missouri and Iowa. It was a, just absolutely catastrophic event and likely the most disastrous natural event in, in terms of dollars in um, the state of Nebraska. Wow. No. You have an article called, What Does Abrupt Climate Change Actually Do to Your Weather? That's on your Patreon site. And I'm wondering, do you expect abrupt climate change? And if so, what is that going to look like? In short, uh, yes. And I, I not only do I expect it, we're, we're seeing it. Abrupt, in, in my definition, is, is profound, and we can define what profound is, but profound change within a human lifetime, basically where the whole structure of the climate system is changing, you know, within 50 to 80 years. And many people have their own definitions for when this this great acceleration in climate change began. Uh, but to me, based on all the data that I've seen, I, I believe that it started in the 1980s. You started to see coral bleaching and the tropics accelerate in the 1980s as the oceans grew too warm, you began to see uh, significant losses of sea ice extent, and particularly the volume, which is based on the extent and the thickness of sea ice in the Arctic. During the 1980s, you 
you know, began to see greater accelerations in heat events, heavy rainfall events. It's been steadily increasing since 1950, but the acceleration in, in the frequency and magnitude of those kind of events picked up in the 1980s and 90s. Fires, wildfires as well. You know, we see massive, massive fires in Siberia, uh, the Amazon rainforest, Australia. You know, so to me, the 1980s, something happened with the climate in the 1980s where it just, it was a tipping point and you started to see accelerations in, in the process of, of change on this planet. And right now, in the late 2010s, we are now seeing the near collapse of the sea ice in the Arctic. We're seeing incredible heat waves in the Arctic, temperatures rising well above freezing way too early in the season. Right now, we're seeing the melt season starting about a month and a half early in Greenland and frequent, frequent heat events in not only the summertime hemisphere, such as Australia, which had its hottest summer on record, but in the wintertime hemisphere in Europe, in Canada. So to me, we're already in a rough climate change. It's already been happening for much of my lifetime. I'm 35 years old. So most of my lifetime has been the process of the acceleration of climate change. But it's only going to get worse as the mechanisms that allow the planet to amplify what humans have done over the past 250 years continues to, to accelerate as well. Backing up what you just said, just out in recent news, a collection of climate models from some of the big names like NOAA and the National Science Foundation project much faster climate heating than the older models did. So instead of 2.5 degrees C of warming, our current path takes us to 5 degrees of warming and beyond, and that is catastrophic. Now, if this science is confirmed, it's another game changer that the public has not heard about at all, and that really worries me. Yes. I actually uh, discussed this with some friends of mine today that uh, under have some understanding of climate change, and one of the things that I had concern with was the lack of, to me, the lack of connection in climate science between, say, the modelers and those in the field that go out in the field and also paleoclimate uh, climate scientists. Because I've, I've literally have read papers, you know, scientific papers in the past two or three years that have suggested that for a doubling of the CO2 carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, or the equivalent of that with other greenhouse gases, such as methane, nitrous oxide that you get from industrial activity, agriculture, and increasingly from the melting permafrost, that you can get a rise of four to six degrees Celsius, or about, you know, about seven to 11 degrees Fahrenheit globally, global average mean temperature, for a doubling of carbon dioxide concentration, greenhouse gases. And also a suggestion that that sensitivity, as we call it, the climate sensitivity, is greater as the climate warms. So it actually increases non-linearly. So to me, the, seeing this from the computer models, the newer, newer generation computer models, it's doing nothing more than confirming what was already known about the past during the ice ages with natural climate change that occurred over thousands of years or tens of thousands of years. You know, and, and, and for me, you know, I'm a meteorologist, and I deal with computer models all the time. These are forecast models, so they're different from climate models in terms of how they do their, uh, do their calculations. But one of the tenets of dealing with models is that you have to understand what they calculate and what they can account for. And the climate models up until recently, at least, could not account for some of the more rapid changes in climates, even in the distant past, like millions of years ago, when they run the models to try to determine their level of accuracy compared to paleoclimate understanding. And they do not account for many of the feedback mechanisms that the Earth essentially uses to amplify what humans have done to the climate already to make it go to a higher temperature faster. And so, to me, the models that, they, that they've created, the newer generation ones, may be doing a little bit better job at capturing these processes, or at least implicitly in calculating them, and they're therefore they're showing what paleoclimatologists could have told you 
was probably likely based on past events, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years ago, and also based on what many of those in the field that study the, the ice in the permafrost would be able to tell you the same thing. So for me, it wasn't a big surprise, except that they, that they may be actually creating models that are getting it a little bit more accurately. And of course, that's bad news because that's pretty much what you would work with for projecting in the future, and the future looks devastating for humanity. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is Nick Humphrey, the meteorologist, and we're talking about the difference between what is happening and what we're being told, I guess. So as weather consumers, we're always looking to see those records break. And if a record doesn't fall, then we tend to think, well, that isn't so bad. We've seen worse than this. Nick Humphrey, what is wrong with that mental attitude? Obviously, records matter. And if you exceed a record, and especially in a warming planet, that's a, that's a big deal. But this, and this goes somewhat into what I was discussing in my article about what abrupt climate change actually does to weather. Because a lot of people really don't understand what it does to weather. As I stated earlier, it's not only about breaking records. It's about changing the very statistics of your weather phenomenon because that's what climate is. Climate and weather are two separate things in terms of how they're defined, but they're interly connected. So climate is the statistics of the weather type of weather events that you get. So you have, say, with rainfall, you get a certain average frequency of rainfall. You have your extremes you know, which you've had in your climate record, however long it is, for having no rain versus having this much rain. But then you have your distribution, your typical distribution, and that can be in a day, on a particular day every year or over a season, et cetera. When your planet's warming, in this case, you start to see more of those events on the margins change. So you get less, perhaps more days where it's dry. But then you get a few of those days where you get these huge, huge rainfall events that never existed in your record before. So those might be your records. But then you're also getting overall drier. And your more typical events, they either shift a little bit to dryness or a little bit to wetness, but they make whatever is overall happening in your local climate much worse. So if you're not getting a lot of rainfall, you end up adding more drier days than wetter days and it ends up drying out your soils. And in many parts of the Southwest, this is what's happening with aridification. Your deserts are actually getting drier. Your deserts are, are going into a, a perma drought. You know, it's, that's what it's been called, but it's not really a drought. It's an actual change in the behavior of the soil moisture where there's just less moisture and it just stays at a new normal, but it's never really a new normal. It just keeps getting drier and drier and drier as much as the planet's warming. Or, for example, here in Nebraska, you know, you look at even recent events where you get a jet stream that's weakening because of a rapidly warming Arctic. You need a temperature contrast to maintain a strong jet stream. Warming Arctic means that the temperature contrast weakens, and a jet stream becomes wavier, more turbulent, more chaotic, with huge waves that extend very far south and very large ridges of high pressure that send very warm air up into the Arctic and, and, and feed back on warming the Arctic. But in Nebraska, you get a lot of snow and a lot of snow and a lot of snow. And then suddenly you get abnormally warm heat from, say, Texas in the south. That flash melts that ice and snow in a matter of like 48 hours. And you have a, a gigantic apocalyptic flood, you know, almost where it destroys your bridges, destroys your it kills your livestock, destroys your farms, destroys your dams, and then you're back to some little sense of normalcy, but you just had an extreme event that was really loaded up by abrupt climate change affecting the weather in the Arctic. That's really the thing with weather, and I think that's why a lot of people, when they see these weather events, especially locally, they don't connect it to what's happening globally or what's happening in some distant, faraway land you know, up in the where the Santa Claus lives. It's basically they can't see the fact that these things are loading up on them like like a gun going off or a bomb going off. But that's what happens. You get a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this that usually would not happen 
in your normal stable climate, and then you hit a little little short term tipping point and it blows up in your face, and that's really what's happening. Typically, that would happen once in a while somewhere on the Earth. You get these extreme events here, extreme event here. But now I can literally do like a climate report like I did uh, on my Patreon blog for March. And I can literally just have slides of insanely extreme events that in any given year, say the 40s or 50s, would have been notable by themselves, but they fill entire pages <laughs> of slides that I present. You know, you have the you have Cyclone Adai in Mozambique, you have extreme heat in Australia, crazy heat in, in winter or early spring in Europe. You have extreme heat relative to normal in northern Canada, extreme heat throughout the whole Arctic, actually, extreme heat relative to normal in my hometown of Seattle, where it was almost 80 degrees in March. I can't ever remember seeing anything like that when I was little. You know, you have all of these things happening all over the world that shows localities are increasingly being stressed by climate change, but the whole globe is being absolutely pounded by the heavyweight champion of nature, you know, just absolutely pounding, pounding, because there's just so much energy in the system that always has to be released, either in heat, either in torrential rainfall, either in drought, taking the water from your soil to produce that torrential rainfall somewhere else, or in these titanic superstorms, you could call them, that tear through areas that never experienced anything like it before. Last summer, you were featured in a Mother Jones magazine article explaining why the extreme heat is way worse than you think. A new summer is coming in the Northern Hemisphere. Why is extreme heat worse than we realize? Well, that's, extreme heat is quite literally the signature symptom of global warming. And the thing about extreme heat events is that the extreme heat events themselves are both in the land and in the ocean. So, you know, even 20 years ago, I never really heard many people talk about, or 10 years ago even, talk about ocean heat waves. But now it's, it's, it's talked about all the time, this section of the oceans having a heat wave. Basically, it's, you always have, like, areas where there might be slightly anomalous heat or such, but in this case... You're getting heat waves in the ocean so extreme that they just wipe out coral everywhere across the planet. And this, we saw this in 2016-17 where there was widespread coral bleaching and, and, and fatality of coral uh, across the world. And so obviously that affects hundreds of thousands of species that depend on coral reefs for their very ecosystems and ultimately their survival. Meanwhile, on land you're having a phenomenon that's really ramped up since the late 80s and into the 90s where, you know, a lot of people talk about, as I mentioned earlier, Arctic amplification of warming that we can suggest for him. You also have land amplification, and that's simply because the land areas, the actual physical land mass can't retain as much heat as the oceans, so they release their heat back to the air above them, warming the air faster over the land than in the oceans. Obviously, for the oceans... In the ocean species, a little bit of warming is potentially lethal. But on land areas, the species, some species can take a little bit more range of warming. But as we've gone on and on decade after decade, the past three decades, you've started to get warming events so profound over the land masses that it's starting to kill the wildlife on land. So you have Obviously, 2003 was an extreme event for heat in Europe that actually killed tens of thousands of people. You had extreme heat in Australia that actually killed flying foxes. They literally just fell out of the sky or fell out of trees because it was simply too hot for them. Uh, you have kangaroos. You know, um, I mean, I could spend probably a whole show talking about Australia, just how, how abrupt climate change has pounded the, the heck out of Australia. I mean, you have kangaroos going into the cities to find water because it's so dry everywhere. And then, you know, here in the U.S., you've had, in the last drought they had that's now ended, at least the short-term drought, last year you had horses, wild horses, dying just in the middle of, the, of uh, arid areas because they couldn't find adequate food or water. So these extreme heat events, they become so profound that it moves beyond with what the species can handle And ultimately, it it will get to a point where our crops in the middle of our continents of the world will have greater and greater difficulty being produced 
and that's already happening. I mean, we, we really started to see a lot of that last year uh, in Europe, um, not so much in the U.S., but in Australia, in Central and South America. There's been increasing drought. The tropics are beginning to become very hot. Um, and obviously in the Arctic, the reason I was, re- I was reporting on that and was interviewed for that story was because there were 90-degree temperatures being found in northern Siberia near the shore of the Arctic Ocean, which obviously has impacts on the permafrost. I mean, you just have permafrost that just melts, that melts. The land slumps because the permafrost holds the land together. You get mass melting of the permafrost, and it turns into carbon dioxide and methane release. And to have those kind of temperatures up there, in the, even in the middle of summer, that were 40 or 50 degrees above normal Fahrenheit was a profound, you know, to me, a profound shift in the state of the Arctic. And we really continue to see that with these extreme heat events. Extreme heat is a highly anomalous heat compared to the 20th century. So um, it doesn't have to be hot for humans. It can be hot for other species and, or hot for ice. Because as you lose that ice, you lose a, a crucial source of a heat sink where heat can go into melting and re- or refreezing the ice when it's released from the, from the water or reflects light from the sun. So that's sea ice, polar ice at the ice caps, glacial ice in the alpine regions of the world, and obviously the permafrost holds all that organic compounds that can be decomposed by bacteria and potentially turned into carbon dioxide or the very uh, potent greenhouse gas and methane to accelerate global warming even more. So to me, the heat is, uh, besides perhaps the water, the power of water and the floods that are increasing on the planet, is really a a kicker for uh, putting the biosphere at risk because it just has most of the life on this planet just has certain conditions of which it needs in temperature to survive. And if you're changing those, those temperatures so rapidly, not over thousands to, uh, you know, 10 or 20,000 years, like as we did when we came out of the last ice age, but in a matter of years to decades, that's absolutely catastrophic for life forms that need natural selection evolution or to have a chance at adapting to such changes. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. Covering the world, this is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. You are tuned to the one and only Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. And I'm really pleased to have as my guest American meteorologist Nick Humphrey. We're talking about the gulf between weather reporting and ongoing climate change. But as you can see, Nick is really in-depth on all of these issues. Meanwhile, thousands of people had to abandon their homes in Ontario and Quebec, Canada. And that includes the country's capital, Ottawa. But that won't stop the Canadian government in their crazy buyout of a pipeline from the tar sands to Vancouver or the so-called Canada East Line. It seems, Nick, we just can't stop building fossil fuel infrastructure even as our population gets flooded out or burned out as we were in the West or or just dies in the heat as many, many people are doing. It's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. To me, at this point, the amount of greenhouse gases that we've pumped into the atmosphere and what we've done already as as a species and obviously... You know, some are far more responsible than others, particularly, you know, the developed world and in the consuming world. And obviously others in the developing world are trying to catch up to what we've done, which um, exacerbates it. But there's already been so much done that I don't think there's uh, much of a path to get away from catastrophic climate change. But to me, to, to continue to see all of this, even though you know, everyone knows what's already been done and what's and what you do further if you do more it, to me it's, it's it's grotesque you know it's like you know giving someone with lung cancer that they got from you know smoking cigarettes for 50 years giving them you know well you're going to you know you're going to die anyway here's another pack of cigs for you you know it's just kind of, it's kind of like regardless of whether you view the world as being on a path that cannot be avoided or not that's my personal opinion on it. You can certainly do things to not 
add add additional damage to your world and to the species of this planet. And it just does not appear that the world's leaders or industry or anybody is particularly interested in doing anything of, of any consequence. I mean, how many... I mean, I always joke around, you know, how many, um, you know, cops have we had the climate meetings, you know, since the early 90s, where every year the carbon dioxide concentration be- continues to go up. It's just, you know, it's mind-boggling. We have COP 22, 23. I mean, I've lost count now, and it's it, they're almost, almost seem pointless. Yeah, I look at just this week, they had a meeting of diplomats in Paris. I read about this just today. Um, where they were looking at the indicators for basically the destructive nature of humans on this planet, you know, and to put it mildly, you know, where they were looking at, they had made targets, I believe in 2010, the UN did, on protecting more species, making more protective areas, um, reducing deforestation on the planet, and most of those uh, most of those goals failed miserably. I mean, they were just, uh, just blown off the water by the relentless growth of everything. I mean, you grow your, the economy on your planet, you're going to, that, that the economy is a representation of energy usage on this planet. It's like a thermodynamic engine. And the more growth you have, the more waste you have. So the waste can come in greenhouse gases. It can come in industrial pollution, radiological pollution, Plastic pollution, which is everywhere on this planet now, and every every person on this planet, essentially. And the exponential growth comes at the expense of all the resources you're literally throwing in the wood chipper to produce that kind of explosive growth that has no end. So even if you slow your population growth, and I know the rate of population growth is still increasing rapidly, but it is slowing compared to the past, your increased consumption you're still getting the same devastating effect. It may even be worse because you have lots of people in the developing world that, you know, in a social justice perspective, have a right to want to be at some level to what we've had because we took a lot of those resources, we being anybody that's living in the developing world like Britain, United States, Canada, et cetera. But, you know, so many of, of our predecessors caused so much damage leading up to now and now Folks in the developing world feel they have they want to join in on the right to a decent living, but it causes further destruction. It's a it's an example of just how like uh, how unfair the world is. But that unfairness was built decades ago, or even hundreds of years ago, leading up to the problems we have today. And it's it's a really sad state for the world where you you open up a news uh, a news story. Not many news stories like this will be on the six o'clock news, but you open a news story and you see, oh, a million species could go extinct in the coming few decades. Rainforests are being destroyed at this such and such rate. It's accelerating. And and you know that that means terrible things for not only the other species on this planet, but for humanity. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. In the news from Mauna Loa, Hawaii, we learned that the weekly carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are now hovering around 414 parts per million. It seemed like yesterday it was just around 403 parts, and 414 is literally off the charts. If you make a chart showing CO2 for the last 800,000 years, and Sam Karana at ArcticNews.blogspot did that, and you pretty well need to add a whole new page on top just to see our current levels. And that's, as you said, just CO2. It doesn't count the stronger greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous dioxide. And I was interested at truthout.org. Dar Jamal wrote, the last time there was this much CO2, trees grew at the South Pole. Now, it'll take us centuries, a long time to get there, but that seems like where we're headed. And so I predict that children born this year in the American South may well end up living in northern Canada if they live at all. And ditto for kids born around the Mediterranean, where millions are already leaving. Do you think I'm being too extreme when I say those things, Nick? Uh, No. (laughs) I mean, it's um, there are others that have had the scientists that have had sort of the the guts to say something like, like that. I mean, Dr. Peter Wadhams, Dr. Ira Leifer has actually suggested that 
you will probably have a few survivors or attempted survivors trying to get up to the Arctic in the Northern Hemisphere. And with, as you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, with the other greenhouse gases, it's, a, it's around the equivalent CO2 level is around 500 ppm. I mean, that in paleoclimate wor- you know, world, you know, going back 20, 30 million years, that you would have an average surface temperature of between 4 and 6 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, that, you know, that's going to make much of the U.S. and Europe aridify. They're going to undergo aridification. The Amazon rainforest will just die you know, Australia will become, I mean, it's already becoming uh, in, in incredibly hot in Australia. It's um, kind of shocking to see um, just what the climate change has already occurred, what's happening in Australia. I mean, I keep mentioning Australia, but it just seems so crazy what's been happening there in that region, let alone what happened in, in my part of the world. But, you know, when you get those kind of temperatures, and the thing is, is that, yeah, although you had trees growing at the South Pole, the thing is, the climate change that occurred naturally was over the course of uh, tens of thousands of years or, or even longer, many tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. It was natural because of just changes in the CO2 level in the atmosphere, what was being retained in the oceans and, and the rocks versus the atmosphere, um, and vol- natural volcanism, and also the position of the Earth relative to the sun. So long procession of changes. This is... Um, Basically, we're burning, we've burned about 200 million years worth of plant growth in about 250 years. Basically, it took 200 million years for plants growing continuously to sequester or store in the ground the carbon that we've released in 250 years. And about 50 million years of that plant growth was released in the last 25 years, 25 to 30 years. So you're talking about a, a massive injection of ancient carbon into the atmosphere, and, and it's causing a, a level of change and a rate of change that just hasn't been seen in Earth's history. I mean, I, 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 that's not really an exaggeration. I mean, it's the only thing I could compare it to that would be faster than this, and you, it would go on the cold side, of course, would be asteroid impacts. Like 66 million years ago, the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs dropped the temperature of the Earth, I think, about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Um, globally in a matter of a, of a few years. This is obviously potentially going the other way, not quite as fast, at least so far, but it's getting to the point where it's getting at a speed that a lot of, particularly the larger life forms, the mammals, the larger reptiles, you know, large life forms cannot adapt fast enough because they just need certain environmental conditions. And so humans obviously knowing what's happening or will know if they don't realize already, yes, you could see massive migrations. But, of course, the, the, my fear is, is that, as we already see from the somewhat hostile um, hostilities toward migrants coming from the Middle East or from North Africa into, say, Europe, into the United States from uh, Central and South America, that as climate change continues to become absolutely devastating, it will become far more uh, devastating, particularly heat and, and heavy rain events in the tropics, and you're going to have go from thousands to millions and, and potentially more people retreating north, and they're going to be meeting hostile, you know, Americans, Canadians, Europeans that don't want the crowds of people because they're going to be concerned about their resources that may be uh, under threat by climate change as well, and then they have to feed and clothe and and give water to all these millions of people that are suddenly retreating and uh, basically abandoning these countries. I mean that. I mean that's let's call it what it is. We're, that's what's going to happen. You're going to see cities and countries just be abandoned in in the tropics. I mean you can't have uh, uh, temperatures rising to two to three to four degrees in a matter of a few potentially a few decades and not have stuff like that happen. I mean, it's just, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be ugly. I mean, if you just look at the trends right now in global warming, in sea level rise, basically what most people see in 20, you know, 75, 2100 looks increasingly likely for 2050, (laughs) you know, just looking at the trends, 
And obviously, these new generation models may be starting to suggest like, explicitly in their calculations the exact same thing. You know, I, I could easily see just based on an exponential trend that's already been, you know, exponential trend that's already been occurring in global sea level, you could see over a meter or near a meter of sea level rise by 2050. You know, that, I could, that could easily happen to me because of the exponential injection of water that's coming in from Greenland and increasingly from Antarctica. And you could see, even if you don't account for all of the methane and other greenhouse gases that may come pouring out at more rapid rates from the permafrost in Siberia and Canada, you could easily see global average temperature of well over two to two and a half degrees by the 2040s and over the land masses of three and a half degrees. I mean, that ends up causing devastating impacts to crops, devastating impacts to human health because of extreme heat events and increasing humidity from increasing evaporation, um, aridification of the land, fires, um, and obviously the collapse of species, particularly insects, which are already on a path to go extinct uh, in this century, and there may be relatively little of the biomass left even by mid-century, again, assuming that there aren't these other tipping points that we just hit, we don't notice until they're in the rear view mirror, and then they accelerate things even further. I'm just giving the trends that appear to be going on based on what's happened since the 1990s and 2000s into into present. So for me, I mean, it's it, it's dire, and I think you know people need to be prepared to hopefully have some <laughs> um, uh, compassion for people that are going to be coming from areas that are going to fare far worse than us perhaps in the north more uh, initially, but even here, you know, anywhere in this part of the world, in Europe, in, in, um, in North America, um, Asia, we're already facing some, some significant devastating impacts from climate change that will, uh, that will affect us as things get worse in other places. Yeah, and it's not just weather and heat and and the super storms that we've seen. We've seen these giant cyclones, but also, as you mentioned, sea level rise. And I got the startling news, Jakarta is sinking. Now, it's partly because they've drained out all the groundwater below them and other factors, but it's also rising seas. And that's just one of many sinking cities, uh, not New Orleans is one, but Lumberton, South Carolina, Italy's Venice and Rotterdam in the Netherlands. There's a whole thing called the Sinking Cities Project, and the whole coast of New England is kind of sinking due to long-term glacial uh, pressure that isn't there anymore. So I, I guess my point is rising seas are not going to be reported first by climatologists. It's going to be reported as weather, as storm surge smashes ashore, as salt water replaces the groundwater. And people like you will probably be on the front lines of that story too, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, um, when I talk about sea level rise being, you know, such and such by the mid-century, and one has to look at the baseline. Where's that baseline from? That baseline is from the early 90s or mid-90s when they started taking satellite measurements. But if you look at tidal gauges, sea level started to, well, the earliest that we've re- recorded sea level rise is 1880. So since about 1880 till the end of last year, we've already had about a quarter meter of sea level rise. But that's since 1880. So basically, climate change first started to get felt in probably thermal expansion. So you warm the oceans just a little bit and you start to rise them. And also, to a smaller degree, but it's increasing dramatically recently, the melting from Greenland and Antarctica. But some of these processes started in the late 19th century. So you could literally go to a place in, say, Florida or Louisiana or Bangladesh, that was there, that was dry land in 1880, that is no longer dry land anymore. It's under sea level. But beyond that, there were probably areas that did not flood in a, st- in a, in a storm of a certain intensity in 1880, that by 2000, they got storm surge by the same, by the storm of the same strength, because you've raised the mean water level it now can surge so much farther inland than it could in 1880. 
And obviously with, say, Louisiana, Louisiana has lost a lot of sediment that would otherwise replace the sediment that's already in the Mississippi Delta because of damming of the Mississippi River. So that's caused part of the wetlands and the Delta to, to sink. But now increasingly, not only is it sinking by that anthropogenic effect, but you're also getting sea level rise from anthropogenic global warming. So it, it accelerates the loss of land in Louisiana. So now at this point, you could conceivably get extreme storm surge events that could surge well into, into parts of Louisiana because it is simply the whole se- the southern section of Louisiana is just going underwater. You're losing land every single day, every single year to uh, the rising seas, rising absolute rising, but also relative rise from the sinking of uh, southern Louisiana because of lack of sediment replacement. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon because it shows that that humanity is suffering the effects of all of its anthropogenic forcing that is applied to try to control everything. You know, we, we wanted all this energy, we wanted all this power, all this control of the rivers, but now it's it's basically um, shooting ourselves in the foot and a lot of ecosystems that obviously um, populated those areas. They're going to go underwater when they weren't meant to be completely submerged. And, you know, I, I see a lot of, I see a lot of denial. I hear stories or watch documentaries of people that refuse to leave um, their homes in Louisiana as the water slowly creeps up on their small little communities. Or I can just watch Miami where, you're building more and more on the coast, you know, mostly rich house, rich homes or hotels. Even as the sea level continues to rise, the sea level rises exponential. You're getting storms that by themselves will be more capable of surging onto the land, but they also will become stronger because the oceans are getting hotter. And it's like for humans basically to give up their habitat and that's what it is, their habitat that they took over from the natural natural land. It, basically, nature has to wipe that area out and then wipe it out again and wipe it out to the point to where humans say with their, with their economics, um, we can't afford to live there anymore. We have to leave. We have to move on. We can't get drinkable water because of saltwater contamination. Storms are destroying the infrastructure every couple of years. We have to leave. That's how it's going to happen. You know, it's not going to be anyone really deciding to just go. In most cases, it's going to be, can I live here? Can I, can I work here? Can I have a life here? And when it's just kind of obvious you're sitting in a bunch of water that ain't going away, you're going to leave. And that's what, that's a fact that's already starting to happen here on the plains. I've heard, I've heard, I heard um, last month actually that uh, LinkedIn had, had reported uh, to some news agency that they had noticed a lot of people living in this region that were in flood prone areas changing their address, meaning they were moving, they, they were leaving, they lost everything or lost significant amount and they just were upping and moving, you know, that fast. And that's literally what it looks like when, it, when humanity loses its habitat, loses your home, loses your town, you can't afford to farm in that area anymore, your farmland's covered in sand. You just um, you just decide, oh, man, I, I can't I can't waste any more time anymore. I got to make a choice, and I got to make a choice to go live with a friend or go move to another city and try to make something and just up and leave. And that's what it looks like. So that's what that's what uh, to me from the the human perspective, and really the perspective of perhaps a lot of species that may have the ability to try to move to escape. That's what it looks like when it just becomes too bad and you can't survive there. You move on. And um, that's what it will look like for humans um, in the next 10, 20, 30 years. All right. Well, Nick, we're, we are running out of time. In fact, we are out of time. So you're one of the few trained weather experts who looks at climate change as part of the new reality. How can listeners get your updates, Nick? Well, I'm, uh, I do uh, my more in-depth analyses and write-ups on uh, my Patreon account. That's... Um, uh, www.patreon.com slash meteorologist Nick Humphrey, one word. And uh, if you, obviously, if you like my work or whatever, you can uh, leave a donation. But all of my, um, all of my uh, writing is not behind any sort of paywall. It's all public and free. 
And I'm also on Facebook under uh, meteorologist Nick Humphrey. You can search for me on Facebook. And um, I do have a do have a Twitter account. I don't use it as often, but I'm on there um, at uh, nth under dash met for Met. So that's uh, that's where I am on Twitter. So I, I invite people to to come. Just to warn you, I, I am uh, very blunt about the state of our planet and about where I think we're heading. But I welcome anyone with various perspectives and views on on the future to to come and and discuss, and, uh, and I post a lot of news stories almost daily on my Facebook page. Okay, so I'm going to put links to all that in my own show blog at ecoshock.org, and I think it was just fabulous talking with you, Nick, and I hope we can do it again. Keep it up. I'm Alex Smith reporting for Radio Ecoshock. If you have a story idea or thoughts on something you've heard, contact us, radio at ecoshock.org. That's radio at ecoshock.org. Meanwhile, barely reported in Western news media, the strongest tropical cyclone in 20 years has hit India and Bangladesh. As we heard from our previous guest, David Keelings, climate change did not cause the cyclone or hurricane. But once it was spinning on the over-hot waters of the Bay of Bengal, it drove it to Category 3 strength. Fanny has winds over 115 miles an hour, or 185 kilometers an hour. Over a million people were evacuated away from the coast, saving countless lives in India, over 2 million in Bangladesh. But the wreckage, whole cities battered, villages wiped out, it's extreme. In some cities, the storm surge reached 13 feet, hitting such low-lying delta areas. The sea invaded. Hundreds of thousands of people were made utterly homeless and destitute in Bhubaneswar, the capital city of Odisha State. Just trying to bring back electricity on India's east coast will cost hundreds of millions of dollars. No one knows when power will be restored. Keep two things in mind. One, there will not be anywhere near enough aid for those affected. Many lives, businesses, and farms will not return. And two, the global emissions for those people is infinitesimal. They did not cause the warming seas that took the cyclone fanny to such extremes. We did. And we will not pay for the restoration. And we will not stop making it worse. I just want to squeeze in a bit from a teleconference May 3, 2019, hosted by Dr. Jim Bendel with guest Carolyn Baker. Carolyn says, My experience is that so often as we begin to talk about collapse of systems and climate catastrophe, people want to know when. Okay, so when is this going to happen? How long do you think we have? Mm-hmm. And I see this in preoccupation with some of the conversations on Facebook about this. And my philosophy these days is I am really attached to not knowing because I don't know. You don't know. None of us on this call knows when, where, how. And so to stay in that place of not knowing, which is a place of possibility, uh, it's a place of the unexpected, that, you know, it isn't going to unfold exactly as we think or predict. And in that not knowing, I believe, is more potential and more strength than being attached to certainty. That was Carolyn Baker. Find videos of these free monthly Zoom teleconferences at deepadaptation.info. One of my own interviews with Carolyn was broadcast June 7, 2017. I'll put a link to that and the Jem Bendel YouTube in my EquaShock blog. Check out Carolyn Baker's work at carolynbaker.net. I'm Alex Smith. Thank you for listening to Radio EcoShock again this week, and I hope to connect with you again. Radio EcoShock. And if we want to preserve a planet resembling the one that we inherited from our our fathers, uh, we're going to need to change the course of our emissions into the atmosphere. And in fact, there are uh, other reasons that it makes sense to, uh, to do that. And I think we still have time to do that, but unless 
we begin to make changes this decade, it's going to be very difficult to preserve a planet similar to the one that we inherited.